de haberlo conocido un poco antes por trabajo, <ríe> por WhatsApp, nos mandamos información muy interesante. No, lo, no les puedo contar de qué, obviamente. Pero Eduardo es de Brasil y la verdad es que la charla que trae, yo creo que no se la pueden perder y va a estar muy buena, así que muy atentos. Así que Eduardo, Eduardo y Siki, ¿está bien? Eduardo y Siki de Brasil, así que muchas gracias, parte de los seleccionados del Call for Paper. Gracias, Eduardo. Bienvenido 88. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'm Brazilian, but I'm going to speak in English because I thought I would be embarrassing myself by talking to Portuñol. Uh, so instead, I decided to embarrass myself. Oh, thank you. Embarrass myself in English. So <laughs> please, please be kind to me. Uh, but then my talk is going to focus on Latin America. And I think if I started by asking, you know, how many of you had some, you know, not so nice experience with uh, your local governments in Latin America, how, if you have ever been in any way harassed by the police, uh, most of you would probably raise your hands. And well, my talk is going to focus that we're actually seeing things getting worse online. So I'm going to uh, talk about how much Latin American governments are increasing their reach uh, into cyberspace. So, uh, okay. So just for the just for the agenda, I'm gonna set some context on my research. This is mostly academic research. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about threat perception from Latin American countries and from the rest of the world uh, regarding Latin America. And then I'm going to talk about states as threats, of course. And I'm going to share the case of the Ponte Hansomer and the revelations regarding the uh, Dirección General de Inteligencia. That's most Spanish I can speak. Uh, <laughs> intelligence agency from Peru. Uh, and it's an interesting case, a work in progress, and I think you'll, you will enjoy uh, seeing the details. And some final uh, thoughts and, and remarks on my research. So, who am I? Of course, I'm not originally a computer science guy. I'm actually a lawyer 20 years ago, uh, but my whole family is full of engineers. So eventually I kind of realized that making requests in Python is easier than in Portuguese. I eventually worked for the government uh, during major events, World Cup and threat assessment uh, profiling. Uh, during the Snowden case revelations, it uh, was quite interesting being on the side of a, you know, spied on government. And well, after that in 2020, I decided to leave my governmental position and now I'm a researcher at the University of Brasilia, focusing on the intersection between cybersecurity, international relations and law. And What you're about to see is uh, part of my research as a Chevening Scholar at King's, Co uh, King's uh, College London, uh, which I have been in last year as a master's student. And of course, a disclaimer, this does not represent any of my former employers, nor the university's opinions, so most of the conclusions, uh, it's hanging on me. So, well, the first is the questions are we in fact lost? And I'm going to argue that as Latin American societies, I think we are in a way, I think we're lost uh, regarding cyberspace. Uh, but when I did this talk in Europe, and I did once in The Hague, I did that John Oliver thing about where is Latin America? So uh, embarrassing our, our former colonizers. Uh, of course, uh, the idea here is not to, you know, to portray just the, the joke but to remind us that we're actually far away from those geopolitical uh, tectonic plates where they encounter themselves, you know, Southeast Asia, Middle East, and now Ukraine and Russia. And this might give us a false sense of, you know, uh, irrelevance or, or, or the fact that we are not a part of a, a major uh, conflict uh, within the region. And in fact, uh, when we think about it, we might not be Uh, preferential target for outsiders, but definitely as a society, we are targets from our own uh, governments. So that's the, the main idea that I'm trying to convey on my presentation today. So 
Uh, my initial research focused on national cybersecurity strategies. That's the document usually governments publish when they try to say that they think that cyberspace is a big deal. Uh, usually what you see in documents from Latin America is describing, you know, threats such as cybercrime, hacktivists, and even conventional threats such as cartels, organized crime, or in Brazil, as we like to call it, milicias. Uh, usually they say they're writing a, a national cybersecurity strategy to protect the population from those kinds of threats, which kind of makes sense. But the weird thing is, you never hear about you know, neighboring states. We're not seeing, we don't see each other as threats. And we don't have a single word on you know, cyber offensive capabilities. So no government actually acknowledges it's buying something like that. No government is actually saying uh, if they're going to buy something like that, what they're going to do with it. So this is you know, an issue if you think about it because uh, we do have, you know, some lawful measures that are able to be taken. At least in Brazil, we have, you know, communications interceptations done through judicial process and oversight, but we don't have anything about cyber operations. And that's a question, why? Why don't we have that? And my argument is that governments actually prefer this way. They prefer this, you know, gray zone where it's not entirely clear what they're doing, if they're doing that for a criminal investigation or for intelligence purposes or whatnot. But Latin American countries are going for cyber offensive capabilities and the idea here is to demonstrate that for you. Uh, evidence of at least 12 countries that uh, acquired and used in some cases cyber offensive capabilities. Uh, but two things are, I think are important. First of all, the idea of Latin America seen as just a cyber criminal haven in a way that the only cyber offensive activity here comes from you know, uh, uh, crooks and, and, and organized uh, uh, criminals and eventually some hacktivists, uh, of course. Uh, but if you think, if you, as I've been in the UK, usually when they ask me, it's just about that. Ah, so some carding stuff, some new stuff, oh, that's impressive, amazing. You guys have a fintech, uh, a new fintechs, and they're targeted constantly. And while that's true, I'm not saying it, it's not, it's just it's an incomplete picture. So that's uh, one of the things that we tend to overlook is our long history of military coups and you know, oppressive governments. And usually they, they have this figure of strong government that is going to protect us from what exactly, but not themselves, of course. So that's the idea here. I'm, I think I'm, I'm trying to, in a way, picking up the uh, Eva's talk about uh, uh, radicalize, and, and in a way I'm trying to, to portray our governments not necessarily as agents of cybersecurity, but perhaps as threats themselves, at least in a way. So I'm gonna start, of course, the idea of digital entrepreneurs here is trying to you know, give a, a, a nicer portrait for uh, eventually data breaches and cyber criminals. Uh, usually Brazil makes the headlines on data breaches because we are a big country, so whenever you see like 200 million databases, 200 million uh, citizens database, uh, being leaked is it makes the, the global headlines and of course I'm putting Argentina right next to Brazil because this is not exclusive from Brazil usually we see it uh, Brazil uh, playing a part because of that because of its size the interesting thing about this and this is a, a small comment on cyber criminals is the idea of uh, entrepreneurship in Brazil we have now several groups that are taking these databases that are leaked and they're uh, they're making new applications, they call it panels, pinais, uh, which they made available that information that was leaked for the average citizen to, to make queries about the information that it, the, the citizen might have. Of course, sometimes they charge for that, so it's, it's sort of an entrepreneurship in a way, and I'm not so sure they're you know, abiding by data protection laws in Brazil regarding that, but nevertheless, it's, it's a way to show that this kind of information is available, for instance, in YouTube videos. So it makes us wonder, why do you know, Brazilian government 
eventually try to buy NSO Pegasus. If you want to chase cyber criminals, just go and ask for metadata from YouTube, from Google, and which makes me wonder. And of course, hacktivists, we also have hacktivists. You guys have it too. Uh, this happens in Brazil a lot, defacements, those, those kinds of things, you know, data breaches from regional governments. And just a picture of Colombian election uh, this year also uh, was plunged with uh, lots of, of hacktivist uh, engagement. But the idea here is go beyond that, beyond that, those traditional Latin American threats. And I'm going to address a few APT's campaigns because they are targeting Latin American countries, but not as part of a huge worldwide operation, but as a targeted uh, Latin American uh, uh, audience. Uh, they usually are written in Spanish, so likely being conducted by threat actors from Latin America, or at least Spanish-speaking uh, threat actors. I'm going to address three uh, APT campaigns and two uh, countries that we have strong evidence that are using uh, cyber offensive capabilities. So the first of all is the Pack Rat. Eva mentioned it earlier. It's operation that uh, Citizens Lab uh, described. It's interesting because uh, the actor displayed a, a huge knowledge on you know, the political uh, spectrum in Latin America, left wing, uh, right wing parties. And the targeting was uh, high profile uh, uh, political figures such as Alberto Nisman, which was a prosecutor in Argentina. Eventually he was murdered. And, and uh, the idea here is, is this uh, operation was targeted against uh, a Spanish speaking audience. And the code itself contained several Spanish uh, language commenters. So it's likely from uh, a local threat actor. It's interesting as well because a cyber uh, citizen lab, when they describe this campaign, he actually mentions that in a, in a given time of their investigation, they actually exchanged some messages uh, with the threat actor. And the threat actor actually made uh, physical threats to, to John Scott Rattel, the, the, the main researcher at Citizen Lab, which makes us wonder that eventually, if in Latin America someone says they're going to brute force you, they might not just use John the Ripper, but they, they might go a step further and then brute force you for real. So. At the end, uh, there is no uh, conclusive uh, attribution to any country. Uh, however, they consider this to be most likely a state-sponsored attack. So this is probably, you can say, is the first, because it was 2015, if I'm not mistaken here. Uh, it was the first APT from a Latin American threat actor against, another, uh, against uh, targets in Latin America. The second one is not so well known because usually uh, the Chinese company called Kihu uh, uh, covers it with the name APT C36 is the way they brand their threat actors. Uh, but Blind Eagle, I think it's the name at ESET from Slovakia, uh, who makes some sort of, of telemetry on this threat actor. Uh, interesting because it seems to focus on Colombia, on Colombian uh, targets, as well with the use of Colombian infrastructure. And the timestamp from the actions and the compilation of binaries suggests a correlation with the time zone consistent with Colombia. So uh, it's, it's another interesting case where we have a local focus, a focus on a particular Latin American country. We could go on, you know, to talk about other APTs that come from, you know, Russia, China, the US, whatnot, and then focus on Latin America. But this is we doing stuff to ourselves. So that's why I chose these particular three, uh, two that I presented, the third one right now, the El Machete, which is probably the most uh, famous of the three. Uh, it's interesting because last year, uh, Blake Giovanni from CrowdStrike at CyberWarCon, he actually uh, attributed to Colombia. So you can check out his YouTube talk uh, and, and he describes why and how the, they managed to make that attribution to, to Colombia. Uh, I find that this particular APT uh, interesting because it actually had some spear phishing documents uh, written in Portuguese 
which was amazing uh, from my perspective as a researcher. Uh, it had uh, a Word document that described a visit from our Ministry of Defense, uh, Haujumba, to a small city in Mato Grosso do Sul, which actually happened. So it shows uh, how detailed uh, the spear fishing and, and how uh, real uh, they were trying to make to collect information. So uh, this is by far, I think, the, the, the most compelling evidence of a local APT targeting uh, 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 local uh, Latin American targets. And of course, the main targets that you may be able to extract from uh, APT reports, you know, silence and uh, other providers uh, suggest that Venezuela, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, and several other uh, Latin American countries were target of El Machete. Uh, these are APTs, but we have also, and Eva mentioned that, of course, Mexico is probably the most active country, and here I'm not actually saying that Mexico has a threat actor. No, it's actually the Mexican government from law enforcement. They do have uh, local law enforcement, similar to Brazil. We have estados, provincias, uh, which we have uh, law enforcement in, in those regions, and they have some level of autonomy, and that happens in Mexico, and they pretty much 11 of them purchase uh, Pegasus and start to use it uh, uh, hack And well, they undergone some cyber campaigns from 2015, and, and it was interesting because Citizen Lab even uh, uh, displayed a, a, a list of targets from the Pegasus, and you have, you know, people researching obesity through the drinking of, you know, soda and drinks, and these were targets from Pegasus. It's, I, I can understand the argument for buying Pegasus because of drug cartels, but if you're going to use it against people doing research on obesity, it, it doesn't really make sense. And of course, uh, a huge number of journalists and people with political affiliations, not necessarily uh, friends with the local governments, were also targeted. Uh, super interesting also, Guacamaya Leaks, which you guys probably heard of, uh, also uh, uh, leaked a lot of information on the uh, Mexican army. And you do have this preliminary report uh, where you can find ejercitoespia.mx, which is quite an interesting thing. Uh, people are trying, try, starting to process the information and you know, revealing more targets and what appears to be the fact that also the Mexican army purchased the Pegasus uh, tool and also used uh, against uh, political motivated uh, targets. So this research is, is ongoing right now. In the fifth case, I think it's maybe a, a different one, not so known about, but it's certainly the bizarrest one, is the case from Panama. Uh, former President Martinelli was actually charged and convicted of you know, unlawful use of two hacking tools, the Pegasus and the, the hacking team, the, the, the Galileo hacking team. Uh, in the case of hacking team, they kind of realized at the end of the investigation that, you know, there is no, no, uh, uh, no trace of, you know, the, the admin uh, uh, part of the software within the Panamanian uh, uh, state. So they concluded that this could all happen from somewhere else. But the weird thing is the targeting, you know, political oppositions, even his uh, ex-wife was targeted with some of these uh, hacking tools, which makes you wonder why would someone do that? If you have, you know, email exchanges from Adolfo Obario, his personal secretary, with the hacking team revealed by WikiLeaks from uh, the purchase of hacking team. But anyway, uh, the, the interesting detail here is how much this mingles with uh, the idea of cyber diplomacy. So allegedly, uh, a New York Times report said that uh, NSO Group actually was chosen because part of the payment would be not only money, but eventually diplomatic support in the UN <laughs> from Panama. So it's a kind of a bargain for, for Israel in a way. 
Well, eventually he was extradited, and I think he's now in house arrest for several other crimes, not only this one, but this is uh, uh, an interesting case where we have uh, the acquisition of cyber capabilities from a government and the use completely out of you know any uh, uh, normal sense, or at least what you might feel it's justifiable in a way. So, focusing the idea on states as threats, uh, this is this slide tries to simplify uh, most of my research, and what you see on those slides are the countries that I found evidence of some level of uh, government uh, cyber offensive uh, purchases. Uh, in a few cases, because of the source of the information, we were able to identify even the purchaser. That's the case from the Brazilian Federal Police, for instance. We have emails exchanged from the hacking team leak, where you could see actually the, the business evolving, you know, which Brazilian company was actually doing the selling. It was called Yasnitec. And the same for uh, some other countries, of course. Not all the information comes from that leak. We have several other leaks uh, uh, in the last decade or so, and several other reports from Citizen Lab and even EFF uh, reporting on these kinds of deals. And well, I summarize them in this table where we can see uh, from the amount of purchases and the amount of spywares uh, from the, the, the last column on the right, and the providers on the second column, you can see uh, countries purchasing different kinds of, of offensive capabilities. Uh, it's interesting uh, to notice that it's not a particularly politi politically oriented uh, you know, government that did. We have left wings and right wings governments doing similar things. One might argue that is not exactly, you know, the president elected had decides on this, and that's probably true, but certainly it does reflect that intelligence agencies and law enforcement operation in Latin America are operating probably without the necessary political oversight, definitely without the necessary public oversight. That's for sure, uh, and. As I promised, I'm going to focus on a particular case, which is kind of interesting because it's a new one. It's from the Peruvian uh, intelligence agency. And this, this was uh, a finding that I did because basically our friends from Conti Hansoware targeted several ministries in Peru, including the, the Ministry of Interior. Uh, which would be in Brazil something along uh, Ministerio da Defesa or something like that. It's not exactly the same divisions. I, I, I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, but eventually they started to, to leak part of the information. Apparently Conti Hansoware doesn't realize, didn't realize that, you know, Latin American countries are not very fond of paying, you know, for, for their ransom uh, demands. Uh, so I downloaded uh, the information and started processing, uh, you know, natural language, uh, a host of information is too big for a human to read. So uh, one of the, the huge packages was quite interesting to take a look was some email exchanges. And what I'm about to present comes from those emails uh, exchange from Dihimin with a particular American company that was uh, offering uh, a few cyber offensive solutions. And we started with something quite simple. It's one of those uh, products that was being offered. It's called Medusa. It's for open source intelligence. One might argue that this is kind of OK. Uh, anyway, the information is over there. Some of the features are interesting because they actually say that they can infiltrate eventually WhatsApp and Telegram groups and collect information from that. Not so sure how much of this is actually a capability or just, you know, uh, uh, eventually the, the, the seller trying to, to, to make uh, his case for, for purchasing this, this tool. Another tool, also not this, that much uh, impressive, IMC Catcher. We have several providers for that. 
Uh, on the top, you guys can see the, the logo from the American company. These documents were actually attachments through emails exchange uh, from, from the company and uh, the Dihimin. And of course, why not? Why not buy some, some of Clearview AI technology? Uh, some of my Peruvian uh, researchers uh, say, say to me that it's not exactly lawful to collect you know, whole troves of information for facial recognition in Peru. And this is certainly would be an issue if this was in Brazil. And of course, this is a new technology and the way each Latin American country is dealing with this is not exactly clear to me. I, I don't have knowledge on that, but I'm pretty sure that this is something that is of a recurring issue and we should be talking more about this. How are we going to use AI, for instance, for uh, uh, law enforcement operations? And a fourth uh, technology, which I'm not, not sure if you are aware, the SSS, SS7 protocol, which is a protocol that uh, helps the, you know, the mobile connect to the network. Usually this solution is advertised as a tracking, 24 seven tracking uh, device. You only need uh, the number of the phone or the identification number of the mobile device. So you can track people 24 seven. It's interesting to notice that at the bottom, you can see a, a text in Spanish. I'm not so sure you can read it, but uh, I'm, I'm, the idea here is that you should not use this solution, as the, the, the seller is, is claiming, that you should not use that solution on the United States uh, phone numbers, which is nice. It kind of reminds us that I'm selling technology so you can you know, mistreat your own population and not our, our own. This is, this is kind of the idea of, of this, uh, this solution. And the last one, I think is the most impressive, is this. It's called, it, it was called in this PDF proposal, Arpon, which is roughly, I think, hook in English or something like that. And it consists on a all-day, uh, all-click solution, uh, targeting uh, Android devices and WhatsApp users. And this is kind of amazing because if you, take the time to read the kind of document that Dihimin was producing as part of their job. You know, we have the email exchanges, we can see what they were doing. They were tracking people, you know, blocking streets because of, you know, social issues. Uh, do we really need these kind of devices to tackle that problem? Do we really need this kind of offensive capabilities? Does it make sense if you think about a threat modeling perspective? You buy this kind of stuff to target people that you know are complaining about social uh, uh, issues? I'm not sure. Uh, some of the features, as you can see, uh, the emails were from September, October 2021. So you see the last uh, Android version, uh, uh, the 11.0 version was covered with that uh, exploit, and you go for the traditional uh, features such as, you know, taking control of the device, taking pictures, collecting information, yada, yada, yada. So it's pretty much the standard uh, surveillance package tool. And the cost for that? Well, the proposal here suggests $1 million for a three-month period, targets with 50 targets available and eventually $4 million uh, for every three months uh, subscription. So if you think about it for a country that's pretty, you know, cheap, that's not expensive. You know, uh, I'm pretty sure if you go and talk to, as I did sometimes as I worked in the government I, and I talked to law enforcement in Brazil, they said, oh, we're underfunded, we don't have any money, but this is not that much money. And what you're able to do with something like this, it's, it's uh, hideous. It's amazing if you think about it, that this is going to be used by one guy in a dark room who doesn't necessarily need to you know, explain to a judge or a prosecutor after what he's going to do with that evidence. And that's the main issue here. We only, I only found out, and we now know this about the Himin, because Conti Hansomer decided to leak the information. 
it was not a political action from country ransomware. They probably didn't realize what was in those documents, those trove of documents that they leaked. Uh, but it's amazing. And this is one of the cases that if a small American company can sell this information to a government, what else might be going on? And so I decided to track uh, that company, that American company called the Duality Alliance. You can see they have a website. It's not exactly uh, impressive. And I realized that two of their uh, C-level uh, uh, employees, they actually appear on the emails exchanges. Uh, those two, uh, Miguel Bolivar and Jorge Bonilla, they were you know, engaging in uh, um, conference calls, explaining how the solutions worked and doing all the, the, the negotiations and uh, the payments and so forth. But it's pretty clear that this company is not the one providing those solutions. It's pretty clear that that our own solution is not provided by this company because they're actually located in a house in the suburbs of Miami. So this does not look like a successful startup cybersecurity or cyber offensive uh, company. It seems like it seemed like a company that was reselling something from someone else. So I kind of looking for the documents. I realized this is this is most likely the company behind it. It's called Aumenta Group. It's actually an American company uh, based in Philadelphia, and they as as I put it in the text uh, below, is actually an integration of several tools. They actually resell products from other companies as well. And they have that one, the Capture One, which was one of the products being sold. And well, the cool thing about this is that they actually have a branch in, in Bulgaria, in Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria. So I'm yet to uncover why, if this is just, you know, labor force from Bulgaria working on smaller wages for them, or is actually some sort of connection with, uh, for instance, Citrox and Intellexa, which are providers uh, from a, a cyber offensive tool called Predator, also sits in lab, reported on that last year. Uh, I wasn't, I, I, I'm not able yet to make any connections regarding these two, but this looks like probably the next step where I'm heading to. Uh, the idea of this is being actually produced maybe in another part of the world, you know, global, globalization uh, as, its, as its finest. You know, a guy in Sofia writes a software, he sells to an American company, and then the American company talks to former U.S. military contractors, and they go to Peru to sell it uh, to an intelligence agency. That's pretty much the trail I have so far. Uh, but this shows, uh, goes to shows that this might be happening in Brazil, might be happening in Chile, might be happening in other Latin American countries. I would say it's probably happening uh, right now. And well, my, my closing remarks and my takeaway about this talk and, and, and the way I'm approaching this, of course, is, it's going to sound uh, uh, politically motivated. Uh, but I think one of the things we have an issue in Latin America is the lack of you know, clear communication. If countries were writing national cybersecurity strategies, they want to protect us from harms and threats, and I think this is a legitimate uh, government uh, function. It makes sense. Uh, we, why? Why are we ignoring you know, basic cyber hygiene? Why governments are not doing that, and instead they're going for cyber capabilities, cyber offensive capabilities? Does it make sense? You're not doing exactly the defense and security. You're going on the offensive. And that's the thing. On the offensive against whom? Who, who is the target of these kinds of operations? And since we don't have, and this is a good thing, we don't have animosity among countries. You know, Brazil and Argentina have a, a nice, you know, rival and stance in football, but that's, that's it. That's pretty much it. We don't see each other as rivals. So it's probably not the case that the Pegasus is going to be used you know, as an espionage geopolitical tool. It's probably going to be used domestically. And we don't have 
the best historical record on law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies. That's the case in Brazil, and I'm pretty sure that's the case in, in most uh, uh, of Latin American countries. So we now have several documented cases of cyber offensive capabilities abuses, and this makes me concerned, and that's why I'm doing this research, so we can raise awareness. So if countries are going for cyber offensive capabilities, and they might, I'm not saying that should be completely forbidden, but if they're going for, they should talk to us. Why? And how exactly are they going to use that? So that's the, 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 the main takeaway here is, I don't think that's a solution, but if they think it is, they should talk to us first. So uh, I appreciate the time and the attention, and I, I, I'm, I'm available to questions and comments, please. Uh, thank you so much for your, for your patience. So, so my question, uh, maybe it's more legal than technical, but lucky for me, you are a trained lawyer. Um, so uh, I think that in Latin America, we do have, I mean, there is a need for intelligence, as in there are many drug cartels, there's human trafficking, there's smuggling, uh, there are armed groups, uh, so intelligence, I believe, is needed, but what can we do to make sure that intelligence is actually, or tools or capabilities are used to fight like things like that, as opposed to uh, protest and demonstrations and mm -hmm. stuff that we are not interested in fighting? No, I think I think you're you're right. I think. It's, it's reasonable, it's, uh, it, you can make the argument that these kinds of tools might be useful in fighting bad guys. I think that's, that's the, the, the bottom line. I, I don't think you will say that, you know, uh, drug cartels, uh, you, you cannot use that on drug cartels, for instance, or in Brazil against militias or PCC or organized crime. Uh, but if you're going to do that, you should be doing that in a, you know, a, a lawful and a criminal prosecution uh, uh, shape and form. And what I mean by that, I mean that, uh, for instance, in Brazil, whenever you try to, you know, see financial records for someone or trying to intercept their phone calls, you're going to ask for a judge to do that. And the Fiscalia, the Ministerio Público in Brazil, the prosecutors, they're going to agree with that or deny it. So you do have oversight. You're targeting the bad guys, but there's more people in the loop. And here, what we're seeing, at least in the case of Conti Hansenware, in uh, the, the Conti, I'm sorry, the Dihimin uh, uh, case, and if you see the Panamanian, the Mexican case, you're not seeing, uh, you know, oversight on that, political oversight. And I can, you know, say, from, for instance, in Brazil, in Brazil, we don't have this kind of conversation. We're not having. So if you ask me, uh, what's a logical next step, I would say we should talk about it. If we are going to, uh, you know, talk about cyber offensive capabilities, okay, we're gonna buy them, who's gonna buy it, who's gonna use it, who's going to, you know, have oversight over it, you know, is a third party is going to be allowed to check logs to see if everything is okay? Uh, I think that's, you know, that's, on, that's the only way where society can, you know, give power to governments at this level. Because at the end of the day, these kind of capabilities, it's, like I said, it's pretty much the best way to get inside someone's mind. You have access to his phone and, and his, you know, browser history, which can be embarrassing sometimes. 
Aló, aló. Hola. Oh. Aquí arriba. Hola. ¿Qué tal? Una consulta. Presentaste varias eh, estadísticas y situaciones que están pasando aquí en Latinoamérica, pero hay algo que nos está afectando también a nosotros acá en esta parte del sur del planeta que está relacionada con las agrupaciones de Guacamaya. ¿Qué nos puedes decir al respecto de eso, de cuanto a esta agrupación y qué otros eventos han ocurrido en otras partes de Latinoamérica? Ok. Oh, the Guacamaya, the Guacamaya case is, it's amazing because it's like a huge amount of information on different countries. Uh, we had uh, some leaks from, uh, I don't know how to say that in English, Estado Mayor from Chile, which is kind of interesting. Actually, I'm taking a look at that right now. Uh, uh, nothing this spicy like Conte, to, to be honest, uh, but uh, Colombian, El Salvador, and also another Peruvian leak. Uh, the amount of information, to be honest, is like huge. Terabytes of information, sometimes it takes uh, time just to download it, you know, unpack it, and you know, starting to index in something like Elastic or something like that. So it takes a lot of effort, and you're not really sure what you're looking for. To be honest, I only was able to find out the, the Conti, uh, the Peruvian case inside the Conti leak, uh, because I, you know, tried some fuzzy words on, you know, surveillance and monitoring and, and so forth. And it's probably, there's more on those leaks, probably. Uh, in the case of the Mexican army, the leak already revealed the use of Pegasus against some targets. The Mexican government kind of, you know, acknowledged that in a way. In, in the typical, you know, way that you kind of says, uh, yes, I did, but I wasn't really aware of you know how bad it was. It was something like that. Uh, as for uh, older leaks, I would say if you're if you're really curious about you know reading some stuff, you should have a look at WikiLeaks because they usually they index most of these uh, uh, data breaches and they do have some wonderful stuff about uh, hacking team and the spy leaks, uh, which happened uh, the the year ahead, yeah, it was from Finesse Fisher as well. So I would say that those older leaks, they still have information if you're, if you're interested in, in having a look. And, and of course, Guacamaya leaks, but most of it is not, I think it's not available for download right now. I think only for journalists and a few uh, researchers, uh, I only had access to a part of it. So uh, not anything particular on that case I can share right now, but thanks. Hola. Primero, muy obrigado por la presentación. ¿Ok? Y la pregunta va, teniendo todas las expectativas que has dado en América Latina a nivel de ataque, ¿cierto? No solo en el gobierno, sino lo que pasa con los ciudadanos. ¿Crees tú que debe ver, no, toda América Latina se debe enfocar en algún modelo de referencia? Tenemos, por ejemplo, Paraguay, que tiene una política de ciberseguridad que se basa en CISControl, ¿cierto? Pero tenemos, eh, acá tenemos el Instituto Nacional de Normalización, que adapta, ¿cierto? En Perú, la norma técnica peruana. Pero creo, no solo basta con estar en el Tratado de Budapest, ¿correcto? Que estamos adscritos, sino eh, en qué modelo de referencia nos podemos nosotros basar. De repente en Estados Unidos, con NIS, Framework, CISControl, en ISA o los ocho controles básicos que ofrece Australia o en Canadá, ¿cuál crees tú que como América Latina debemos tener eh, una cultura? Um, okay. I've, just, I've just been informed, uh, we had a, an issue trying to, to translate the question, so I'm, can, you, can you repeat, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I think it was an issue with the translation. Yes. Sorry. Ok, ahora. Sí. Sí. Primero. Uh, can, no. can, can you repeat? Uh, okay. okay. Sí. Primero. Ah. Muy obrigado por la presentación. <laughs> okay. <laughs> ya. <coughs> vale. <laughs> oh, buen punto. Muy obrigado. <coughs> Eh, América Latina, si bien es cierto, 
has eh, presentado varios casos. No tenemos alguna estandarización a nivel de, de un estándar de ciberseguridad. Paraguay tiene una política de ciberseguridad que aplica a los control en versión 7. En Chile tenemos un Instituto Nacional de Normalización que adapta la ISO. En Perú las normas técnicas peruanas también han adaptado. Y cada país, si bien es cierto, va creciendo a como ellos pueden. Colombia tiene un Ministerio de Tecnologías que va adaptando también algunas políticas. Según tu experiencia, yo entiendo que no solo basta con eh, adherirse al Tratado de Budapest, sino en base a tu experiencia, ¿crees que debemos tener un, un modelo de referencia en Estados Unidos como NIS o los SIS Control, o en ISA, por ejemplo, europeo, o los controles que, o los ocho controles básicos que ofrece Australia? ¿Cuál crees tú que debemos tener nosotros, toda en Sudamérica, el modelo como referencia para poder implementar y estar unidos en estos temas de ciberseguridad? Oh, muito bom português, very good Portuguese. So, <laughs> no, I think you're right. I think uh, the idea that you know, as a region, we don't talk to each other as much as we should is pretty clear. You see a Brazilian guy who doesn't know how to speak Spanish, so we're talking in English here. It's not exactly the ideal uh, situation, and and, and I. And I say that as, as a Brazilian that should learn Spanish and not the other way around. I'm not trying to, you know, you guys should learn Portuguese. That's not the case. Uh, but I agree with you, I think, in terms of, you know, uh, standardization or at least, at least creating some sort of dialogue, threat, uh, intelligence sharing. You know, we don't see that. Uh, for instance, I've been in Brazilian government. I was close to Sechirgov, which is, you know, uh, uh, incident response from Brazilian government. And we don't have, we didn't have at least five years ago, I'm not so sure right now, but five years ago, we didn't have like the smoother relations with our, you know, uh, regional counterparts. And at least to, to exchange that kind of information, we should, we should be talking to each other. I'm not so sure about, you know, which model should we adopt because usually models come with the baggage in a way. Uh, if you think about the European Union, they they kind of have a framework, bigger framework that encompasses everything. So kind of cybersecurity is just another box inside of that. And I think at, at least, you know, some level of, of threat intelligence sharing we should have. I think we should go further. For instance, if governments are really serious, for instance, we're going to use cyber offensive capabilities against drug cartels. Well, drug cartels, are operating uh, regardless of frontiers, regardless of the country. So it would make sense uh, that you have some sort of an understanding on that. Can you imagine having a guy uh, targeting someone from a Brazilian telephone, for instance, because that Brazilian guy is actually from an organized uh, crime organization that operates in Peru, for instance? Uh, that could create some friction, and I do mean in an in a honest sense, friction from prosecutors then, who is going to charge him on what? So even at that level, we could have some sort of engagement. But I think the grimmer side of it, it's we don't have really a framework for that. You know, we tried some sort of, you know, uh, economical uh, proximity with our, our, our regional partners, but we don't have any of that in track. So. I'm not so sure we have a nice standard for that. I'm not so sure we have a model, but we are definitely not trying to make it happen. So that's, that's a shame, I would say. Hola, hola, hola. Oh. Mucho gusto, me llamo Jorge. Soy estudiante de ingeniería en ciberseguridad, cuarto año. Y más que, nada una, más que nada quisiera hacerle como una, que me diera como una sugerencia, digamos así. Eh, actualmente estoy con mi grupito de, de la universidad, que viajamos desde de La Serena hasta Santiago. Y más que nada, como le decía, quisiera que me diera como una sugerencia, digamos, cómo podríamos nosotros, digamos, empezar en cuanto a los... Eh, en el mundo de la ciberseguridad, es decir, ¿qué nos daría, qué consejo nos podría dar? <laughs> Muchas gracias. Well, I would say the first thing you should definitely go come to 
8.8 every year. So def that's definitely one thing. <laughs> no, but, it, but I mean, one of the things I, I think it's, it makes sense is it, this kind of event, it allows networking. And that's, that's really important. Uh, I, I mentioned, for instance, I'm a lawyer by craft training, but uh, eventually, uh, the Brazilian government it works in a mysterious ways. Because I had some knowledge of you know, computer science through my family, once I was selected as a lawyer, those guys kind of asked, ah, you know, uh, those know how to code something here. And I kind of raised my hand that eventually I was you know, s swept away to, to work with that in, in, in government. And this particular example, I think it's interesting because uh, it shows that anyone can evolve on that. You know, I, now I'm a good user, good developer in Python, natural language, mostly because I want to do something specific. If you ask me for, you know, deep cybersecurity uh, concepts, I'm, I'm not aware of all of them. I I'm, I'm definitely wouldn't make it to a CISP uh, test or something like that. Uh, but I have some particular knowledge to something that I'm applying myself to, to research. And I would say coming to this kinds of conference and having a study group helps you uh, realize what your main interests are. And eventually, once you find that, I would say to you that go for it. You know, uh, search and study and practice. And GitHub is there and Google Coding is there. You know, anyone can code these days. You know, you're hearing this from a lawyer. You know, I, I can code. So I would say that you have to find your passion. That sounds, you know, maybe corny. Uh, but that works. It really worked for me. You know, I'm 12, 15 years uh, ago, I would never imagine I would be doing this kind of research. Uh, so I say, create networking, finding your 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 expertise, your passion. This will will help you a lot in the future in in cybersecurity. But you can also make some money eventually. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. It was really incredibly interesting. And um, I'm particularly interested in your research on Panama and, and maybe in abuses for former President Martin Lee. I, I don't know what have you found that is that you can share with us right now? Uh, most of the things that I, uh, I had on the Martinelli case, uh, they came from two sources. One of them was reports from Citizen Lab. So if you just email me, I can send you the whole thing. And the second one, yeah, please. And the second one was actually uh, some documents, uh, indictments. It's like, uh, I, I think they, they were able to translate indictments. But the idea of indictments uh, from the Panamanian government to the US government for the extradition. They kind of explain a bit of what happened in terms of, of, uh, of misuse of those oh, hacking tools. Uh, but f drop me an email and I can send you all that material because most of it is, is open source. And usually uh, in my papers, like academic papers, I'm not going to bore you with that, uh, but they, I'm only reference to you the, the Panamanian case in like one, two paragraphs. So probably the, the raw information is going to help you uh, a lot. Oh. Hola. Thank you. Um. Primero que nada, agradecer por la presentación, muy completa. Eh, quería hacer una consulta. Sabemos que eh, a nivel internacional, eh, es todo este monitoreo que, que se está realizando por grupos organizados, eh, no gubernamentales, otros gubernamentales también, significa quizás un intento de protección eh, para los distintos gobiernos, quizás para las personas, pero... En el sector privado también existen diferentes tipos de monitoreos pensando en controles, ¿cierto? Para cuidar los intereses de las de la empresas. Uno de esos controles, o, o entre ellos están los DLP o los CASB. Eh, ¿Cómo ves tú, o cuál es tu opinión respecto a este tipo de monitoreos eh, en términos éticos y en términos de eh, qué tan buenos o malos pueden ser para eh, la privacidad de las personas? 
I think that's a, that's a good question and a hard one. Uh, I would say, I would say the problem with once, once we start to entertain the idea, you know, that, well, maybe the private sector, maybe we should allow, us, allow some organizations to do those kinds of, you know, surveillance measures. It's, in a way, it's like Eva mentioned the idea of, well, we're going to protect our kids. So it makes sense. I have two, two children at home, so it, I, of course I'm worried when I see my kid, you know, playing Minecraft and, 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 and sending messages because you don't know who's on the other side. But as much as it's tempting that we construct, you know, like we do a threat modeling on, well, where I'm going to protect them from what's out there, I think the main issue is that you're not able to protect them full time. And, you know, private actors are not able to protect, uh, you know, 100% of the cases. And, and who's going to watch, I mean, who's going to watch the watchers in this sense? I think we have to have some sort of boundary as much as it creates risk. Because we're going to be exposed to potential threats. We are not supervising, we're not overseeing everything that's going on. So I think as much as it sounds arbitrary, I think it's better to have some sort of boundary and not, you know, bargaining with eventually saying, well, in that case, we might go, in that case, we might allow uh, private actors to do that. In that case, we might allow, I think that's, that's the core uh, point. We should have some level of conversation and decided on it. And this should be a boundary that we should abide to it. Uh, for government perspectives and, of course, from private perspective. Uh, not so sure it's easy, you know, to do that, but I think it's essential. De nada. <laughs> De nada. <laughs> oh. No, no se escucha. Ahora sí. Hola, Hola. ¿cómo están? Eh, mira, tengo una consulta. Es que eh, le puse harta atención a tu charla. Eh, porque el tema que no ha ocurrido acá en Chile, que han habido hartas filtraciones y hemos tenido casos de, también de mal uso de herramientas y de, a través de herramientas, por ejemplo, el famoso caso Huracán, que fue hace mucho tiempo atrás, es muy, muy, muy bullado acá en Chile. Eh, entonces me asalta una duda, dado la situación local nuestra. Eh, ¿Tú crees que debe haber eh, una contraparte pública que autorice la compra de estos software en conjunto con el Poder Judicial, en el caso de Chile, por ejemplo, para poder efectivamente que estas herramientas, por ejemplo, ya hablemos de Pegasus, por ejemplo, un ejemplo que no se ha comprado acá en Chile, creo, uh -huh. o si sí, no lo sé, eh, sea utilizada de manera correcta <risa> <risa> eh, hacia lo que es realmente el crimen organizado. Hablemos de terrorismo, hablemos de... Sí, de la forma ilegal, tal vez lo compramos, pero no de la legal. O sea, eh, terrorismo, narcotráfico, crimen organizado. ¿Y cómo serían esos parámetros? Porque finalmente, si tú, no, no quiero que ocurra lo que pasa en México, que Pegasus lo ocupan contra población que hace efectivamente eh, investigaciones contra el gobierno. O por ejemplo, en el caso de la inteligencia en Chile, que hacen investigación o hacen seguimiento en vez de a nar narcotráfico, eh, hacen seguimiento a ollas común o a recolección de leche para niños en pandemia. Entonces, ¿cómo podríamos hacer eso y que exista un, un ente? Para redondear la, la pregunta, ¿es necesario que haya un, un, una contraparte que haga todo esto, que lo supervise y haga la, la, la compra? ¿Tú qué crees? Gracias. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's a, it's a great suggestion. I think some level of uh, public oversight is essential. Once you argue for that, of course, people on the other side of the aisle, you know, the security forces, they're going to say, well, we have to maintain some sort of, you know, operational security, some operations are ongoing, so forth. Uh, so we have to find some middle ground on that, probably. But the idea that if the government want to expand its powers to, you know, surveillance or, or something uh, along those lines in, in, with cyber capabilities, it should provide us with some level of assurance. 
And that assurance can come in form of, you know, congressional hearings. So that's what happens in the United States, for instance, in the UK. Uh, but maybe here it could be accompanied by eventually, like you said, like public oversight. Eventually we could, you know, select people from, uh, from uh, academia, for instance, someone with uh, a technical knowledge and on the other side is not exactly someone in the market uh, concerned about, you know, finger pointing. But that guy from academia could help, you know, definitely needs to help, you know, if you have the same kinds of, you know, congressmen as Brazil does, uh, you, you, you cannot trust them to, to actually do a thorough assessment of what's going on with a tool like Pegasus. So you need some technical uh, expertise, you know. I think the private sector can also provide that eventually. I think we have, you know, cybersecurity people in this room and you work for private companies and I don't think you would, you know, have a problem in, in lending your knowledge to, to that kind of, of uh, uh, service. You know, it's a public service after all. Uh, I think the role model of that, it depends on the country. I would say in a country like Brazil, probably you're going to need to have some sort of public participation, whether through NGOs like Igarapé Institute, for instance, which is famous in Brazil, any concerns, uh, it concerns on, on that uh, digital security agenda. But I think uh, something similar could be done in Chile, could be done, for instance, as legislative or judiciary oversight. I, I don't think that's, uh, we, should, uh, we should look for a, a particular role model. At, even though, if you think about it, this is a new thing. You know, this capability is different from the others. Back in the day, when, when we didn't have mobiles, you needed to follow people, you know, walking after them, driving after them. Now you don't need that. So we do need a model for that. So how we're going to, you know, supervise that, have oversight over that. So public participation, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great solution. I think someone with technical skills would, uh, would certainly help a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> Muito obrigado. De nada. <laughs> y esto es para ti, Eduardo. Muchas gracias. Un aplauso, por favor, para Eduardo.